Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced from alexmerced.com. It's been a while since I've done any kind of political commentary or economics or whatever. Um, I thought I'd come back with to discuss a topic that has been sort of very much sort of in the news, in the consciousness today, and that is inflation. So the purpose of this video is not necessarily to kind of uh, tell you how you should feel about inflation, but to explain you what it is and you can kind of understand the kind of pros and cons and trade-offs uh, on your own. Okay, so what does the word inflation mean? The word inflation just means an increase. And just so you know, this episode will be aired as part of the uh, podcast, will be on the YouTube channel. So for those of you who are listening on one of the podcasts or audio avenues, uh, there is actually a visual that goes along with this. But I'll try my best to explain everything where if you're not seeing it, you'll be fine. But um, essentially... Uh, inflation just means an increase. So there are things like, and again, I like some people just like fight over what the word inflation by itself means. I like to keep things sort of very, very clear as to what I mean. So I'm going to make a distinction between price inflation and monetary inflation. Um, so that we can be very clear about what we're discussing. Um, so monetary inflation, meaning an increase in the money supply and price inflation, meaning an increase in the general level of prices. These two things are very closely related, um, but they are two distinct things. And inflation just means an increase. Uh, an inflation of wages would just mean, you know, an increase in, of the general level of wages. Um, the word inflation just means increase. Okay, so the, I always find that to be as clear as possible in having economic discussions, including something after the word inflation or deflation, is going to lead to a much more productive conversation. So that way you guys aren't fighting over later on what does the word inflation mean um okay so i'll try to be very sort of precise in the way i'm talking about it okay so right now i'm going to just start talking about sort of prices in general okay basically a price is really just a a quantity of a monetary unit and with which you can exchange a particular good or service okay so for and then basically prices can be different depending on what the monetary unit is because again if i might buy something in let's say canadian dollars it's going to have a different price a different amount of canadian dollars that it takes to exchange for a candy bar than it would take in u.s dollars okay the monetary unit the thing you're using as a medium of exchange but now let's imagine that there are only three dollars in the world okay so here's one dollar one dollars make three dollars there's three dollars in the world and all there is in the world is one candy bar that's it that's that's all the goods there are so candy bar okay so that's the pool of goods okay so now imagine that I'm actually now let's say there's three people each of them have one of these dollar bills okay and I have an auction and say, okay, hey, we're going to auction off this candy bar. And then everyone starts bidding and saying, okay, I'm willing to give you 30 cents for that candy bar. I'm willing to give you 50 cents for that candy bar. If each of those people have a single dollar, what is the highest possible price that that candy bar could be bid up to? A dollar, right? Because you can't really bid more than you have. I mean, without introducing things like a credit and, um, you know, and then, and, and, you know, time mismatches of, you know, sort of claims and money, keeping it simple. Okay, so theoretically, again, assuming that I have to pay in full right there and then, I, the highest I can bid is $1 for this candy bar, okay? Now let's imagine that I suddenly give everybody $2. So now we've doubled the supply of money. We've dub doubled the amount of monetary units, but there's still only one candy bar. Okay, now what's gonna happen is now the highest price that it could be bid up to is two. So by creating an inflation of the money supply, a monetary inflation, that possibly led to, because again, doesn't, you know, there may be a candy bar you can bid on, but it doesn't mean everyone wants that candy bar. But you can see how it could easily lead to a price inflation, an inflation of the price level. Okay, um, because at the end of the day, it's just a cross section of sort of uh, the a number of monetary units and two the amount of stuff okay so now let's let's say the world is a little bit more complicated which it is and now there's not just a candy bar but there's a tv 
Okay, uh, palm reading, all sorts of cool things people can buy. I don't know why palm reading, but I wanted to include some sort of service on there. Uh, a palm reading, things like that. So then there's more goods. So yeah, you could bid up the candy bar a dollar, but you know, these people who own these three sets of two dollars may want different things. And hey, you know what? They, this, as they exchange with each other, the distribution of these six dollars may change. So now maybe this person has three dollars and this person has one dollar. So now technically, even though the money supply hasn't changed, because of the distribution of monetary units, it's now possible that this person could bid up one of these three goods, three dollars. Okay, so it's not just like the straight up number of monetary units, but it's also the distribution of those monetary units. So if there's people who hold a much greater number on average, they can bid up certain goods higher. But again, the general price level will probably still be the same because in general, I mean, yeah, this person can bid up something three dollars and this person could bid up something two and bid up something one and let's say that happens right okay so before the average price level was two because they could only pay two and now i have six dollars so if we had one good of three dollars one thing of one dollar and one thing of two dollars again if you average that out that's still two dollars so theoretically the money supply all things give given the money supply is the same and the amount of goods are the same the this regardless of the distribution of money you might have different individual prices so the candy bar may be more expensive maybe that got bid up to three bucks but the average of all the prices paid is still going to be about two dollars okay again we're abstracting out a lot of other factors but the idea is by understanding these things sort of like in isolation we can start piling up the complexity and having a deeper understanding of the world around us that's the goal okay so bottom line is the number of monetary units will affect the price level because again people can now bid up prices if they have more and bid up them less okay so if i was charging five bucks for this candy bar but there isn't enough money going around for anyone to be able to pay, pay five bucks then that price has to go down and so that would be a deflation of the price level that occurred because of a monetary deflation okay but again, what happens what happens if none of these people want to spend money? Like what if just and again, not something likely. People always have wants and needs. People always have their motive things that motivate them to exchange, but theoretically let's pretend. Again, baby here's just to understand that there's other factors. What if none of them wanted to spend any money? What if they were all perfectly happy with their lives? They didn't have like month to month bills and whatnot. So they just had these pieces of paper that they did, did not want to exchange for goods or services. Okay, in that case, the price level would then be zero, even though, let's say I kept printing money. Now all of them had a, you know, $300. Oh, wait, isn't this? Let me, there we go. Let's say each of them have like 100, 100, 100. Okay, I've just increased the money supply by a whole lot. But if none of them are willing to spend it, none of them are willing to bid on these goods and services, the price level will not necessarily immediately inflate. So there's, got, there's two factors here. There's gotta be money to spend and there's gotta be a desire to spend it. This can be referred to as a propensity to consume. This could be referred to as time preference, depending on sort of like what economics book you're looking at. Um, you know, they look at it at different angles. So like the idea behind propensity to consume is sort of your marginal desire to consume things. Like you want to, you know, I'm willing to consume a little bit more. So I'm willing to spend money to do it. While like time preference just means like, okay, when do I, you know, how, how soon, uh, been a while, uh, basically when do I, when do I need that money? Okay. What, when, how soon do I need these candy bars and whatnot that I may be willing to delay my, my, uh, gratification. Okay, cool. So, so we can see that the quantity of money and again, the quantity of goods as well, because again, if there's more and more goods, I have to start, you know, people start having differing desires because everyone wants different things. So that money gets split up over a greater number of goods. So if we can produce goods and services and increase the amount of goods and services faster than the money supply changes, you may not see an overall change in the price level because you're splitting up that money over a growing number of goods. Okay, so there's this relationship between the amount of stuff and the amount of money. Okay. That are constantly determining sort of like on average what the price level should be um now some other factors to kind of keep in the place there's a the whole issue of credit 
okay? So what happens if people start lending each other money? So maybe this person has a hundred dollars, okay? But they're willing to postpone their use of the hundred dollars for like a year. So they'll say, hey, I'll lend you, I'll lend this person over here to a hundred dollars, okay, at a rate of interest. Okay, now so this person has to postpone their gratification for a year. So this is where we start getting more into like time preference. Okay, so the idea is like how how much do they how much would they rather spend the money now? Okay, we got to make it worth their while to delay that gratification. That's sort of what interest is. Is okay. Well, I want to use your hundred dollars now. So this person here wants to use their hundred dollars now. So they have to choose not to use their hundred dollars. So how much will you pay me to do that? How much will you pay me to wait? That's what interest is. It's just this, this desire, this, 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 well, you have to pay someone to wait. And, you know, the more they would like to spend their money now, the more they're going to want to pay for it. And again, I'm, I'll get a little bit more nuanced there as well. Um, but in that case, even though like now on paper, this, they have, this person has $200, this person has $100. On paper, it looks like the money supply just increased because there's $400 because now this person has 200, this person has 100. And theoretically, this person still has 100. They never gave up their dollars. They just lent it out but they effectively can't spend it. So effectively, there's still only $300 to spend in this moment. So that doesn't necessarily, all you're doing is shifting when, who's spending that. You're just making that whole $300 available to spend now instead of saying, okay, this person's going to wait a year for nothing and only $200, $200 are being spent. So what you're doing is you're just increasing the sort of the full utilization of the full money supply. So again, credit doesn't necessarily... A lot of people, like, I think, treat credit as an increase in my supply. And it can, again, because nowadays there is a lot less issue with, like, like there are times where you can just, like, literally just make money out of thin air. Um, but theoretically, on its face, assuming that the person who's lending the money is actually not spending the money in the meantime, technically the amount of money that's available to spend has not changed. Okay, because there's still only $300 out there, so basically the, the money supply in this moment can only reflect the $300 that are available to spend currently, because even though this person still has $100, okay, but then that person has to figure out where they're going to come up with the 100 plus, let's say, $1 to spend by the next year. So then ne ne if they make that money, they spend the $200, and then they make the money back, but then now they got to spend $101 they got to spend $101 to pay back the other person. Now this person has 201 But theoretically, like, the money hasn't changed. But this can be very difficult. Because, like, where's that? If everyone's borrowing money, it gets difficult to pay interest when, 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 the, when the money supply isn't growing. Because there aren't these extra pockets of money that kind of grow the amount of earnings, in a sense. This is why, like, there's always, like, an incentive to sort of keep increasing the money supply. Which, again, won't necessarily change the overall price level. Again, the monetary inflation does not automatically turn into a price inflation because there's this relationship between the quantity of goods and people's individual motivations. And at the same time, how that gets, how those price changes get distributed are different because different people want different things. So the people who do have more money and are willing to bid up more prices, they may have different preferences than people who don't have the money, who might have bid, bid up other different prices had they had the money. So there's all these like, sort of like nuances. And there's also like when it comes to interest rates, there's the fact of like, okay, who are the people who have money? How much money do they have to lend out? Because if I only had $1 and you wanted to borrow my $1, well, that's all I got. So I would have to, I would probably want to charge you a whole lot of interest for you to part with my that $1 versus if I had millions of dollars and you want to borrow a dollar from me, I, I probably won't miss that dollar. So my time preference for that dollar is going to be different um on a basic for each marginal unit meaning for each additional unit my the amount of interest i would probably demand is gonna be different so there's all these sort of moving pieces that are constantly determining the price level okay but again at the end of the day what is determining these things the quantity of money and the quantity of goods so what kind of things will increase prices well again increasing the money supply because that is going to increase people's ability to bid up prices okay so even if the people who receive the new money don't use it, but they lend it to somebody else because they save it in a bank account and that money gets lent out to somebody else, generally uh, you're going to have 100% utilization of the money at all times. Okay? Because again, whoever is not 
using it to consume is investing it and that investment then goes to somebody else usually results in some sort of somewhere consuming down the road okay so pretty much the the, the banking system allows there to be sort of a hundred percent utilization of all monetary units at all times but again those monetary units can only consume goods that exist so while more monetary units can allow you to bid up prices higher the quantity of goods can you know suddenly if you have supply shocks again if you're taking right now it's 2021 so right now you're seeing a mix of all these things an increase in the money supply because they increased the money supply quite a bit in 2020 in order to finance a lot of these uh, programs to respond to a lot of the events of 2020 and you're seeing supply shocks because you know people were at home pretty much all the 2020 not necessarily making things um, the, even if you can make things, the ability for you to ship things across the country are affected. Uh, certain resources weren't being produced, which affects goods that are being produced now because there's supply chain cycles go, you know, sometimes it takes like what you're consuming today are things that were in the process of being produced a year ago. So in that case, if you had a whole year where you kind of shut down production, that whole cycle gets uh, moved, moved in an odd way. So like a year later, there isn't anything there for you to consume and you have to wait like another year for everything to catch up because now you're produced you can't increase the production for stuff to consume now you can for certain goods you only can increase the production for things to consume next year because of the 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 time between sort of getting the resources and then those go to the next level of production and the next level and the next level and the next level so that is so in that case that's going to cause increases in prices as well so um, anything that's going to reduce the supply of goods, make goods less goods for these monetary units to bid on, aka money, whatever you consider money, okay? Um, so, I mean, there's a couple of different kind of dynamics you see, you may see nowadays, okay? So, for example, if there aren't, depending on people's time preference, they may do different things. They may decide to invest the money if they think they can get a yield that is worth the laying gratification. Like I know over the last couple of years, there's a lot of money that instead of buying stuff with, I made investments, whether they are investments that yield sort of a set rate of interest, like like bonds or stocks that pay dividends or staking cryptocurrency versus, you know, um, ones that have a, a, a an expected yield. Like I hope they'll have a yield greater than what I would want to delay me spending that money, like investing in stocks and hoping the stock price goes up or investing in a, in a, a, a different crypto asset, hoping that's going to appreciate or mutual funds or whatever. Okay. So the idea there is those are assets, but I'm not consuming those assets. Those assets represent more like a hope that I will have uh, more in the future. And then I'm investing it into some something where that money will be utilized by somebody else. So I buy, you buy stock, you invest in a company, and that company is utilizing the money. Um, you invest in a crypto, you know, let's say it's an ICO or something like that. Then you know that project is utilizing those resources, and you're somewhere along the line, you're hoping that someone else consuming with your money will turn into a greater valued asset that you can exchange for more money and have more in the future. Okay, because you were willing to be patient, you were willing to wait. Okay, um, so yeah, so again, if you're wondering, you know, it sucks that things are expensive right now here in 2021, ask yourself what's happening to the money supply and ask yourself what's happening to the supply and goods and services. If you understand the chain of these two things, so like one, the number of monetary units and the things that people want to and are spending them on, because there's lots of things out there that are cheap because no one wants to bid them up no one wants them enough so there might be more than enough of that but not enough of other things okay like buying black truffles i think has like gone up quite a bit in the last four years i saw like a recent like npr planet money piece on that uh, highly recommend listening um and same thing again with goods and services now there may be other other types of goods and services like one thing that's always been battering in my head is the idea of like the digital economy. So for example, you know, if I buy a TV, there's one less TV and you can't just make another TV at the snap of a finger. Some factory has to decide how many TVs they're going to make. They have to procure resources to make those TVs. Like there's, there's time, effort, and resources that have to go into replacing the TV that I've consumed. 
okay, or, or the food I've consumed, etc. So when I buy it, when I consume it with money, I've reduced the supply of, of stuff available for monetary units to continuously purchase. Now, if I loot, run out of lives on Angry Birds and I purchase an additional life on Angry Birds for like a dollar, there is some level of time resource, but it's so... Some of that resource was going to be used anyways in terms of like electricity, like the servers that are running that application are still technically going to be on regardless of whether I do that transaction or not. So I'm not necessarily consuming that something that wasn't already being consumed. Um, and two, the rate at which it could be replicated and the scale at which you start seeing scarcity is so sort of vast, it makes, makes me wonder like how, how, what is the effect of like the digital economy and digital assets and digital digital things um, with their effect on like this vastly growing money supply. Like, okay, so yeah, we've increased the money supply by a whole lot, but what happens if you created, but if we're buying digital things, which, you know, the quantity can be sort of very flex, very elastic to absorb that increase in the money supply. Um, if that wasn't the case, can you imagine what the price level may look like? Okay. Although we are seeing increase in the price level because there's still huge demand for things like gasoline and food and whatnot, things that do not have elastic supplies, meaning their supply can't just ratchet up as people need them, so their prices are going to go up. And plus people have, again, more monetary units to bid up those prices. Okay, and you're seeing a bid up of prices of investment assets and consumer assets at the same time. Okay, if you've been watching like crypto, crypto has been doing gangbusters this year and whatnot. And prices of stuff. And stuff makes a lot of sense because you also have the supply chain. But the supply issues don't necessarily always just translate into the same thing for the, the, the investment assets. Because those aren't things that require production. There's underlying, underlying profits and stuff like that. But, again, people have more monetary units. You can bid up the prices of stock, bid up the prices of crypto, bid up the prices of these other things. So it's interesting to kind of think through, like, here's what there is to bid up prices. Why are certain prices going up versus others? And how, what aspect of that is a monetary phenomenon, I meaning governments increasing the amount of money or new mediums of, of purchasing being used and accepted for a wider variety of assets. Because again, like for example, the price of something in Bitcoin is dependent on whether someone's willing to sell something in Bitcoin. As more people are willing to take something like Bitcoin as a medium of exchange and people start exchanging Bitcoin, there's a whole world of prices in Bitcoin that are not, that may be correlated but not like a perfect correlation with like prices in dollars. And this is where you start seeing things of what's called arbitrage, where people take advantage of the difference in prices among different mediums. So for example, I might be able to buy something in dollars at one price and then resell it in Swedish krona at a better price overall, and then take the Swedish krona that I get and change that back into dollars for a profit. Okay, that's what's referred to as an arbitrage. You're taking advantage, not of time, but of the current prices in this moment, I can add, take advantage of the differences in prices to trade in a way that I result with more money without having to wait. Because that's typically how you make a profit. Usually you have to like put, commit capital and wait a period of time. You start a company, you have to wait a period of time before the company profits. You buy stock, you have to kind of wait a period of time for it to go up. You buy a bond and you get interest, you got to wait a period of time for that interest to be generated. Arbitrage is when you can take time out of the, take time out of that equation. The way you can trade a certain chain of assets you can generate profit immediately without having to wait. Um, and that's and that's essentially what a lot of people are doing. They're just looking for arbitrage opportunities. I mean, technically, that's what entre entrepreneurship is. You're still looking for arbitrage opportunities. If I can buy, you know, flour um, and some other ingredients and make donuts and sell those donuts at a profit, I've technically taken advantage of the price of this and the price of that to generate a profit. So, yeah. So... Kind of cover, I'm kind of going off the topic of inflation there, but hopefully you picked up on some insights to help you understand the economic world around you. Hopefully I'll be doing some more of these, more focus on economics. Um, a lot less opinion. I don't necessarily have as many strong opinions uh, these days, more than just a desire to understand and explore what these things are and how, how to think about these things. Um, but yeah, so again, you can watch this here on my YouTube channel. Um, or on my podcast, if you listen to one of my podcasts. If you're not, please subscribe. Just look up Alex Merced on your favorite podcast catcher. And if you're interested in coding in web development or whatnot stuff, also you can uh, check out my development podcast, Web Dev 101. Although I'll probably, I'll probably in the future, I'll be doing another podcast on data because I'm going to start getting more into like data science and data engineering and 
and data technology. So that will be a thing. But otherwise, uh, you guys know what to do. You guys can always follow me on Twitter as well at uh, Alex Merced for more economics -y, you know, pop me stuff or at Alex Merced Coder for the more technology-oriented stuff. But you guys have a great day. It's nice seeing everybody. I'll see you all later on.